embryology in the Qur'an and its comparison to Aristotle, Galen, and modern science. Now in the following passages from the Qur'an, we introduce the concept of stages in human development. Uh, God created man from a quintessence of uh, clay. Uh, he then uh, placed him in, as a nutfa, a droplet, in a place of uh, settlement, firmly fixed. Then we make the nutfa into a nalika, a leech-like structure, and then uh, he changed the nalika into a mudga, a chewed-like uh, substance. Uh, then we made out of that mudga uh, isam, I can't read too well here, skeleton, and then we clothed the bones with muscles. Uh, then we caused him to grow, and then we came into, into being and attained the definitive the human form. Uh, so blessed be God, uh, the best to create. This Fetal development can be staged in different ways, based upon time or based upon different organs and different systems. The Quran describes it based upon microscopic appearance and that description was well advanced in terms of the knowledge of the Prophet peace be upon him and in terms of lack of instruments to enlarge the specimens. That's why Professor Keith Moore had no objection in accepting that the description was miraculous according to the scientific development of the time the Quran was revealed. Now let's examine the claim that this miraculous description of embryology might have been plagiarized from Aristotle or Galen. The ancient scientists who covered a wide range of science in their work, including the development of the fetus, and how the Qur'an used the right wordings to escape becoming unscientific for all future generations. Let us refer to some passages from Aristotle, which show his concept on reproductive biology and their comparison with the Qur'an and modern embryology. To suppose, then, either that heat and cold are the causes of male and female, or that the different sexes come from the right and left, is not altogether unreasonable in itself. For the right of the body is hotter than the left, and the concocted semen is hotter than the unconcocted. All concoction works by means of heat. Therefore the males of animals must needs be hotter than the females. For it is by reason of cold and incapacity that the female is more abundant in blood in certain parts of her anatomy. Aristotle, on the generation of animals, page 66 and 67. When the material secreted by the female in the uterus has been fixed by the semen of the male, this acts in the same way as rennet acts upon milk. Aristotle, on the generation of animals, page 34. Since what the male contributes to generation is the form and the efficient cause, while the female contributes the material. In fact, as in the coagulation of milk, the milk being the material, the fig juice or rennet is that which contains the curdling principle, so acts the secretion of the male. Aristotle, on the generation of animals, page 19, is plain that the female does not contribute semen to the generation of the offspring. Aristotle, on the generation of animals, page 17. Aristotle was a very great scientist and he was very efficient observer of nature. He compared anatomy of many animals. But he didn't have all the advanced technology of current times, so he did commit mistakes. He thought that semen was formed in men after a workup or concoction of blood. The blood was ought to be deficient in women due to its regular flow out of their body. So female cannot have any contribution in offspring formation. The menstrual flow was the material which was acted upon by semen to form the child and the quantity of blood mattered and was supposed to be in right proportion. He also thought that women need to have uterus to store the blood and the organ which stores blood need to be larger than the male passages which transmit semen. So uterus is a big organ in the females. We know that uterus doesn't store blood. He thought males and females are formed on different sides of uterus although he wasn't very sure. He also thought that men should be hotter as they need to do concoction of blood to create semen while women don't need to do that. Any of such concepts are not taken in the Quran. 
Aristotle had the concept that females have lesser teeth than males. Quran escapes such errors. This much is for the difference. Coming to similarities between the Quran and the Aristotle, we should note that Aristotle described the formation of fetus from menstrual blood and the Quran used the word alqa which was translated as blood for a long time. Quran is a moral guidance for humanity. If it had directly said that the earth rotates around the sun 1400 years back, how many people would have stayed confused for more than 1000 years about its reliability? The same is true of the word alqa. Aristotle said blood is the material on which semen acts to create a child. Quran used the word alqa, one of its translation being blood clot, saving Quran from becoming unscientific for more than a thousand years. When modern science will discover the development of fetus befitting the other meaning of the word alqa. This is Hirudo medicinalis, better known to you and me as a leech. It's a parasite. It takes whatever it needs to live by sucking the blood of whatever it can latch onto. In this case, that's me. As it sucks my blood, it takes from it all that it needs to live. It literally lives off me. And the whole of pregnancy is shaped by a similar kind of parasitic relationship. Unlike the leech, the developing embryo doesn't suck the mother's blood, but it does raid her blood for the raw materials it needs to grow. From the word go, both leech and embryo are out for themselves. The cells of the embryo spread out as they divide and invade the mother's uterus. It's almost an aggressive attack. But surprisingly, the army of foreign cells does not meet any resistance from the mother's own defense systems. Alaka. Alaka refers to a leech-like appearance especially at about 22 days, as shown in this slide. This is a leech, and this is the human embryo, about 23 days. I think you have to agree that the similarity between these uh, structures is amazing. Junta de Maulia. Dama. In my opinion, many a scholars might have chosen a clot of blood to translate alaka was because they might have some knowledge of Aristotelian description of embryology, which described fetus to develop from menstrual blood. The common word for blood clot is dam. And if the Prophet had read the Aristotle, and if he was the author of the Quran, he would have surely used this word to comply with Aristotle. But nowhere in the Quran any other word was used in the Quranic staging except alaka. And it was used in the Quran as Alqa is the word that was most proper for all generations of people to understand that we humans have developed through various stages by the power of God, which is what God wants to convey to us. For ancients, translation of Alqa was a clot of blood complying with Aristotle, and for us, it is something that clings. Thus, Allah has taken care of a believer's faith in every generation, and Quran can never be called unscientific for any new development in science. That's why every statement in the Quran that relates to science is such that you cannot falsify it. But the one searching for a scientific statement that will explain the conditions to properly describe ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection or to get criteria of selecting a proper embryo to transfer it for best outcome of IVF, then he is mistaken. That's not what Quran was revealed for. Coming to Galen, who was a very great scientist, analyzing different works of his time and of previous scientists and drawing his own conclusions. He agreed with Aristotle about the role of semen being an active principle working on blood to create progeny as can be seen from his writings. But nature doesn't preserve the original character of any kind of matter. If she did so, then all parts of the animal would be blood, that blood, namely, which flows to the semen from the impregnated female and which is so to speak, like the statuary's wax, a single uniform matter, subjected to the artificer. Galen, on the Natural Faculties, page 14.
He believed semen as seed and uterus as earth. The seed having been cast into the womb or into the earth, for there is no difference, then, after a certain definite period, a great number of parts become constituted in the substance which is being generated. These differ as regards moisture, dryness, coldness and warmth, and in all the other qualities which naturally derive therefrom. Galen. On the Natural Faculties. Page 3. This is what he says. This can be compared to Quranic verse where the word al harth has been used. But Galen describes the growth further, saying that in its substance generate different parts which differ in heat, coldness, moisture and dryness. Something modern science will not give any relevance, nor did Quran give any such statement. That which was previously semen, when it begins to procreate and to shape the animal, becomes, so to say, a special nature. For in the same way that Phidias possessed the faculties of his art even before touching his material, and then activated these in connection with this material. For every faculty remains inoperative in the absence of its proper material, so it is with the semen, its faculties it possessed from the beginning, while its activities it does not receive from its material, but it manifests them in connection therewith. Now, it is not for the wax to discover for itself how much of it is required. That is the business of Phidias. Accordingly the artificer will draw to itself as much blood as it needs. Here, however, we must pay attention and take care not unwittingly to credit the semen with reason and intelligence. Galen on the Natural Faculties, page 15. His concept of semen and menstrual blood was also not in accordance with modern science. He believed semen as active principle acting upon menstrual blood, from which fetus arises. This is wrong as per modern knowledge. Quran also does not describe any such concept. Galen thought that semen has a creative power and it attracts to itself what is useful for it, the amount of blood to create the fetus. And he also thought that semen feeds itself of blood and grows. He described three stages of every organogenesis, genesis, growth and nutrition. He defined genesis as due to generative and alterative faculty. His further details make his description unscientific. These alterative and shaping faculties are only grossly comparable to Quranic staging. First one is the nutfa or the drop stage. And then the, the second is the clack or shaping stage, and then the nasha or the growth stage. Now the proposed system is clear, it's comprehensive, and conforms with uh, uh, present embryological uh, knowledge. The Quran says nutfa, halqa, and nasha. The, this uh, second or shaping stage begins as the alaka which is an Arabic word meaning a leech. Galen's genesis includes nutfa and khalqa, and then he puts growth and nutrition, which does not comply with Quran. While Quranic staging of nutfa is clear cut drop stage, which is semen and zygote, which then is khalqa, means different embryonic development leading to formation of fetus, which then grows or nasha. Modern embryology uses the word zygote embryo and fetus to the very three stages that the Quran describes. Zygote is equal to nutfa, embryo is equal to khalqa, and fetus is equal to nasha. Galen's description of the word semen cannot be compared to fertilized ovum because he does not describe any female gamete. He says the first of that in which as is observed in abortions and dissection, the form of the semen prevails. As cited earlier, what he mentioned was the dominating property of semen while it attracts menstrual blood and feeds on it and grows. This description of Galen does not say anything about female germinal fluid. And as has been shown in the citation above, he believed menstrual blood to behave as a statutory wax to be acted upon by semen. So this form of semen prevails cannot be inferred as zygote or embryo of modern embryology. He then describes the flesh filled with blood in which heart, liver and brain develop and he stated that every organ has its own faculty leading to its formation based upon principles of attraction which means it attracts what is needed and on principle of elimination 
which means it eliminates what it doesn't need an alterative faculty which means that changes the base material to the final material such as blood changing into organs these principles are not befitting to modern scientific advancements and quran does not describe any such thing so what we can conclude that all ancients had a philosophy of embryological development which does not comply with modern science nor with the quran wordings in the quran are jawami al kalim the shortest expression with the widest meaning and so it apparently seems to comply at times with ancient texts but escapes including any unscientific notions present in those texts and if we examine the plentiful description of embryo development in the quran we can feel assured that it is in accord with the modern scientific developments i am not quoting any hadith in this treatise because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself advised muslims not to attribute technological knowledge to him all hadiths related to embryo development were about destiny of humans and were not narrated to tell about embryological developments ya allah ya allah يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا ملك يا قدوس يا سلام يا مؤمن يا مهيمن يا عزيز يا جبار يا متكبر انت الخالق انت البارئ المصور يا غفار يا قهار سبحانك يا وهاب يا رزاق يا فتاح انت القابض انت الباسط انت الخافض انت الرافع انت المعز انت المذل يا سميع يا بصير يا الله